Um, other than the pig roast, which is always the very first week of, uh, or very first Saturday of August, which I want to invite you to, and this year we're going to be um, using our children to beta test the new slides. <laughs> They're safe. Actually, the only thing we're really looking for is uh, to see how much water will slosh out and how fast they'll go or if there are any sticking points or things like that, so you don't need to worry about that. Um, We've never had anybody get hurt on our slides, uh, so they're, they're quite fun, and that will be on Friday the 2nd, so if you want to come hang out on Friday the 2nd, sometimes there's a lot of meat being cooked, uh, hundreds of pounds of brisket, and uh, usually about 100 to 150 pound pig in our outdoor oven. Uh, some people spend the night, some people camp, uh, so it's a great time for kids to come around too, because we will be testing the slides out. That's on Friday, then on Saturday the 3rd is the actual pig roast, that's 10 to 2, you won't want to miss that. And on Sunday, we have um, sort of a graduation party for our kids that are coming um, out of uh, kids' church to be with the adults upstairs or transitioning also as well into the, uh, the youth ministry. And we throw another kind of party for them where we have the slides open on Sunday after church and have, we usually have plenty of leftovers, so there's sort of food provided. Uh, so really fun weekend, that first weekend of August. Uh, if you have to miss it this year, no problem, we do it every year, but maybe you could mark it for the next year, always that very first Saturday, first weekend in August. So that's really the only announcement that I, I want to make at this point, because we've got a lot to discuss today in Genesis 27, so let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, especially this foundational book to your entire, um, to your entire Bible, to your entire gospel. When we understand the foundational truths that are found in Genesis, there's something really powerful that happens as we read the rest of the Bible and we remember where these people and their names came from. We remember how faithful you were to them and how just as well, how merciful, how abundant you were in caring for them and providing for them. There's so much to learn. There's so much to be founded by in our faith. And even if this is something we feel that we've been founded in before, it's a way to grow to the point where we can teach others and influence others in this direction. So thank you for that. And thank you as well for uh, a growing church and the excitement over the ministry of your word at Boone's Ferry that's just palpable. It's not something that we can manufacture. It's just a blessing from you and we want to recognize that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to tell you a story that illustrates, I think, something that um, uh, I noticed as I was studying Genesis 27. And the thing that I noticed was really everyone in this story is against the grain of God's will. Some to more of a degree than others. Some, in, like Esau, altogether generally unrepentant and against the grain of God's will. But Isaac, Jacob, and Rebecca as well, even if they're in a way... Um, doing the content of his will, like with his general plan, they're doing it their own way. And so I want to tell you, it's this idea of against the grain, uh, I thought of it because I was sort of daydreaming during my sermon, you know, I, could, I only focus for short periods of the time and then I, I lose focus and I have to take a break and sometimes it'll just happen to me. And I was thinking back, I was thinking about how they're all against the God's, God's grain and then the story came to me, a true story of when I was in high school and football players like to prank each other and joke around and it's usually a relatively um, a physical prank and uh, much more than any of the mothers want them to be doing and they get in trouble with it and so did we. Uh, Lake Oswego High School played football there. There are these bleachers and they're well worn. They used to be wood. I didn't know that. I mean I figured they probably would under the plexiglass but they used to just be wood. That wore out and they put them this plexiglass cover over it and people sitting on that for a long time made them really slick, you know? So we'd see someone sitting like in, on the edge of one of the bleachers and like the concrete steps are right here. And we'd take a running tar start and like slide and bump them off, you know? And uh, people wisened up and so they would like stand up right before, they would pretend like they weren't and you'd go flying into the concrete steps. And we thought it was great fun. Except I did it one day, and I mean, we would even plan, so I, uh, this isn't quite the finish of the story, but uh, we'd plan so that someone would sit down next to them, pretend like they were interested in whatever they were reading, and then I would come along slide, they'd stand up, and we'd bump this guy off. So we just were ruthless with it. So this one time, and I just know it was God's, uh, you know, God has a sense of humor, and um, you know, you dig your own holes oftentimes when you're trying to get other people, and uh, so there was this one section of the plexiglass that had ripped off. And I don't know if I'd ever seen it, didn't think about it. And someone was sitting right there and not even intentionally, but I came with just a full running start thinking that they weren't even seeing me. Last second they get up and I come to a screeching halt right on top of the wood portion with all the grain going towards me. 
I screeched. I mean, people were dying laughing at me, but it was just about the nastiest wounds you could imagine. All of these splinters everywhere. I had to sit out of practice for at least two days. And I'll never forget it because it was full slide. Like I was going to bump this person hard and I came to an immediate stop. So you can imagine. And I just remember that as funny as it is now, how painful as it was then. And when it comes to being against God's grain, um, you know, if you are like rebelliously against God's grain, you've heard plenty of stories from my own life. You've heard uh, maybe experienced it yourself or heard stories from other people's life that the destruction that happens is, is extreme. It's worse than even just getting a seat full of uh, wood splinters. Um, but sometimes I think what happens in our lives is we allow ourselves to be against, as Christians, as saved people, as people who really believe in Jesus, allow ourselves to be against the grain in small areas thinking that it's not gonna lead to splinters. It's not gonna be that painful. It's not gonna be that problematic, but it really is. And you're going to see that play out in all of the main characters of this story. Um, we actually meet a couple other people other than Isaac, uh, Rebecca, and Jacob and Esau, Esau's wives, but they're really part of a foreshadowing of the next story in the next chapter rather than really about the main point in this chapter. And so when it comes to being against God's grain, there's multiple ways that we can do it. And you're going to see this main point that I'm going to put up here reflected throughout all of Genesis 27. Being surrendered to God's sovereignty means knowing and doing his will his way. So if you, first of all, you might not just be surrendered to his sovereignty altogether. Uh, the Bible calls that being unrepentant, unwilling to have your sins forgiven, just stiff arming God saying no. And Esau was in that position and I can show it to you biblically, not just from Genesis 27, but the New Testament author, whoever wrote Hebrews says that very thing. Um, sometimes you are generally surrendered to God's sovereignty, but there is an area that you don't know his will. And we think, oh, well, are we responsible for knowing all his will? And is it okay to not? And um, I want to talk about the idea of, of when ignorance actually becoming, becomes being against God's grain. Uh, so not knowing God's will isn't actually a way to get out of being against the grain. And then another one is you might know it, um, but you're not doing it. And uh, the author, James, uh, talks about how it's like someone that looks themselves in, at the mirror and when they walk away, immediately forgets what they look like, a person who hears God's will but doesn't do it. And sometimes doing is not so much an actual action, but it's like becoming what you're supposed to, being mastered by his word, thinking the way God thinks, uh, forgiving the way God forgives. Um, they're oftentimes not even so action-oriented and more attitude Oriented. So when I say doing, that doesn't just mean some kind of physical action that you could do, but it's, it's, a, um, it's a thought life attitude as well. So, so, so you might not know God's will, and we'll find out how for Isaac that was not an excuse. And you, you might know it and not do it, which by the way is not wisdom. Wisdom is not just knowing lots of stuff. Wisdom is knowing and doing. That's why the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. There's a sense of reverent fear uh, in actually obeying him because he's God. But then there's another portion of this, which is doing his will his way. We'll find out that Rebecca knew, and in one sense was probably thinking she was doing God's will, but she was doing it her way. And you could take the reverse too. You see in um, his content or his will, you put that in the truth category, his way, you put that in the love category. You'll see people in scripture and in our lives today that will do his will in, in a sense, like the Pharisees. They understood a lot of the truth and they were following a lot of the truth, but they did it in a hypocritical, unloving, harsh and prideful way. So it's not okay to do God's will your way. Uh, it's also not okay to do your will his way. I think the culture in our nation has shifted and that's the primary issue is that for one, probably don't even know God's word, which is an excuse. Then obviously, even when they're presented with it, not doing it, but then yet still claiming that somehow God is love. And so it's loving to, to condone this behavior or that kind of identity or this thing or that, but we know it's not God's will. And so we're, we're, now, we're doing our will and pretending like it's his way. And you can't pull those two apart. You can't pull the truth and love apart. Uh, Jesus is both of those. And so when we're following him and worshiping him, um, you can't separate who Jesus is. He's Lord and Savior. He is true and he's loving. And we need him to guide us into that. So there's all kinds of ways in which you could basically not really be surrendered to God's sovereignty, to his leadership and control in life and over all things. 
One again would not be knowing. Another one would be knowing but not doing. Uh, but then you know and maybe you think you're doing it but it's your way. Or maybe you know and you think you're doing it but it's your way. Uh, or it's, it's your will, his way. So there's so many ways. That you can really see how when God says that our, our hearts are deceitful above all things, um, we take any one of those sentences, which is a sentence that's true biblically, not just from this passage, but from so many others, and we, we find a way to get off of center. And if you're, if you're just directionally incorrect, like Esau was altogether, well, if we think of someone like that, we, we oftentimes think, well, at least I'm not like that. But just any direction other than that, it's, it's against the grain or another metaphor I was watching one of these swim spas where the water's rushing towards you. I think this was actually for an Olympic swimmer. So it's not really a swim spa that you take home. It's like a major elite uh, training device. And they were swimming for as long as they could against the stream, but then eventually they'd get pushed out. So it's like a sprinting drill, but a, but a pool with heavy turbines that are pushing the water this way. And none of the swimmers could swim and make any headway. That's how fast the stream is going. That's what it's like to be not knowing or not doing or his will your way or your, your will his way, right? Uh, and don't, we're going to take each one of those individually and walk through these characters. I'm hoping you put yourself in their shoes. Although you may not be struggling the way that Isaac was being against God's will. Uh, you may not be in Rebecca's category of being deceitful and manipulative. You may not be in Jacob's category where he was also deceitful and manipulative, but by the influence of another person. And you may also not be, um, or I hope you're in, 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 are able to identify one of those places in life, but whatever place you're in, even if it's Esau, where you're currently directionally incorrect with the Lord, stiff arming and say, I don't want to have anything to do with him. Um, maybe he's drawn you to church today to, uh, to be forgiven, to repent, to turn around and be directionally correct with him, to be with the stream of his sovereignty. And there's, there's just no greater blessing in life than that kind of salvation, but also the way he's providentially uh, going to bless you as a result of that. And then you even find out that all the ways in which you've been against the grain, he's actually been withholding some of the worst splinters. Um, that, that you can get hit with in life. He's been restricting the damage you can do to yourself all along. I found that out. I found that out a very painful way that I regret, but I'm still so glad that God did that. So again, being surrendered to God's sovereignty means knowing and doing his will, his way. Let's see how that bears out in this passage. So I'm gonna read some major sections and then come back and talk about each character and how they were doing that. Here we go, Genesis 27. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, and he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now I want to stop right there <clears throat> because already Isaac is against the grain of God's will. It was not God's plan to pass on the blessing. And this is not just any blessing. Uh, generally from any father to any son. It's a very specific blessing. It's considered God's blessing to Abraham that was passed to Isaac. And according to God is to be passed to Jacob, not Esau. Let me prove that to you biblically. This is, I think I have it up. Genesis 25 verse 23 this, I see um, a lot of brand new babies here, another very exciting way that our church is growing with, with new life, and, uh, and it's not easy being a pregnant mother. We have pregnant mothers, we have mothers who just gave birth. Uh, our congregation knows better than, uh, well, better is the wrong word. Our congregation knows really well right now, experientially, how hard um, young motherhood can be, and it was that way for Rebecca as well, because Esau and Jacob were fighting with each other in the womb, striving against each other, kicking, and when man, those floating ribs right here. I've been coughing a lot lately and that cough has returned and I had pneumonia and I coughed my ribs loose, excruciating pain. And it seemed like they're not healing quite right. So just a little bit of coughing will start loosening that again. I can only imagine when a baby is like heel kicking you in the ribs, you know, and especially when there's two. And so she's asking if this is gonna be the, what it is, God, why? Tell, will you at least tell me why? And the Lord said to her in 23, two nations are in your womb and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. And we know that Esau was born first, Jacob born right after him, clutching his heel. Uh, heel grabber or cheater is basically what Jacob means in the Hebrew. And, uh, and so we know that it was God's prophecy and God's plan for Esau to ultimately be 
um, a subservient to, to Jacob and that he was going to pass this blessing on to Jacob. And here Isaac is and planning to the exact opposite. And so we have to ask ourselves the questions like we did in our discipleship communities, you know, was this, a, you know, a willful kind of thing where, because he did favor Esau, remember? Um, uh, Jacob was kind of a, a man of the tents and so he's hanging out with his mom a lot and she favored him. Uh, Esau was a hunter and he'd bring back delicious game and um, I don't know if you've ever had venison but it's when it's prepared correctly, it is quite good and so uh, Isaac loved him more, you know, and, uh, but Esau really turns out to be the villain so I don't know what that means for hunters. I wish that part wasn't in the story. <laughs> um, but any way you look at it, it was not God's plan to pass the blessing of Abraham that ultimately is about Jesus. We went through it in, in chapter 12 of Genesis that he was going to bless the nations through Abraham's offspring, not offsprings. And you might think, well, that's kind of pedantic. Well, no, it's not because Paul says it's important that it was actually uh, offspring singular because he was really talking about Jesus, not necessarily all of the descendants of, of Abraham. And so you would not be here right now. I would not be here right now. Our church wouldn't be a thing if it wasn't for the Abrahamic blessing. And so it being passed on to the son that God intends is huge. Our, in a way, our salvation depends on, on God's will happening. And so it's a big deal that people are against the grain of it. So let's see for a second if we can discover um, whether Isaac knew or not. And, and people argue differently about this. And one of the reasons is that I'll tell you kind of the answer from the uh, very beginning. It doesn't say, doesn't say. And you can use your intellect as well. I'd probably lean towards, I would assume he did. Uh, those assumptions aren't warranted biblically though. And so one reason I do is it seemed like Rebecca and Isaac really loved each other. You know, just got done that story with them kind of flirting and laughing with each other. And Abimelech was like, that, you said, your sis you said that was your sister. That's your wife, I can tell. So they had a good relationship. And this was long before Isaac could have <coughs> become like no Esau and that he was a hunter. This is when they're still in the womb. And so it's very unlikely that they already chose favorites at that point. And so all the reasons why you might think Rebecca wouldn't tell him, you'd think he probably told. I mean, if, if, just think of if you're married, would you, would you not tell your husband something like that? Would you decide to withhold it from him if there's nothing seemingly wrong and you love him? Unlikely, I would say. However, it's very possible that she never told him. There's, there's nothing in, this, in, in the Bible that uh, really, um, really says either way. And so we don't know for certain whether Isaac actually knows. If he knew, then this is a bad version, a really bad version of being against the grain. He knew and he was still planning on passing that blessing on to Esau. Um, yeah, I've heard some commenters saying that he was kind of senile, but all it really says is that his eyes were dim. He was, his sight was going out. It doesn't say that he was senile and, and couldn't understand things. It seems that he can quite, uh, quite clearly understand, and he's sort of almost sniffing out that Jacob's about to try to deceive him. So he doesn't seem like he's that diminished in his mental faculties. Probably some because he's an older age, but he can't see. Uh, that's all that's said. So... Um, but I, I was thinking about this, and let's just say uh, we get to heaven, and God says, yeah, Rebecca never told him that. That's one of the reasons I left it out. Um, I think it's good when but the Bible doesn't say anything to not, just not say we're certain about it, you know? Uh, for one reason, church unity. How can you, um, if you're claiming something the Bible doesn't actually explicitly say, and you claim it with like conviction, well, someone else might read it and it's like, well, I don't see that. So how are you ever going to be unified? It's very difficult to have unity in a church if people are being convinced of things that aren't even there in the first place. Uh, that's maybe different if they are there. But this isn't. I thought about it either way. If he knew, it's worse. But if he didn't know, ignorance isn't really an excuse because for something as important as passing on the blessing, he should have asked God. Had he asked God, God would have said, this is not the son I want you to pass that blessing on to, right? And it would have, it would have stopped, probably really hurt Esau, but it would have not caused anywhere near as much damage. Um, Esau flies into a murderous rage. Uh, Jacob ends up having to leave. And Rebecca never sees him again, it seems. So there's all these consequences for a father to be ignorant of God's will. And uh, we can't claim to know uh, like an absolute prophecy about our children uh, saying this is what's going to be happening to them or not. Um, but there's so much in scripture that we can know for our children. And I would like to expand it just past kids, people that God has given you responsibility for. Might not just be your kids, but <clears throat> if you are in any kind of leadership position, 
management position, or even if you are an, uh, someone who has influence with others, which is literally everybody here, including children. You have more influence than you even know with people just by the way they watch you live out your life. Then before God, you have some responsibility, you know? Remember when Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And the obvious answer is yes, and you shouldn't have murdered him, you know? You should know where he is. You're lying to me. The, the ground, the blood of, of, of Abel cries out from you, against you from the ground to me, God says in paraphrase. So yes, we are a brother and sister's keeper. Yes, we're responsible for one another. And one of the main reasons is, is that second greatest command in all of scripture is that we should love our neighbor as ourself. Um, and so as fathers, uh, especially as heads of household, as leaders within our family and in the community, um, it's, it's not acceptable to not know God's will. Uh, it's right here. It's been right here the entire time. And I have found that it's not like you have to know every section of the Bible. You should be working towards that, working towards a really robust, well-rounded knowledge and understanding of God's word. Um, not just knowledge, but it's not something we're trying to master. It's something that we need to be mastered by. I like to say that because I think it's so important. Um, when you, by the way, try to master God's word, that's oftentimes when you become, uh, biblically speaking, the Pharisee, right? Because you're not actually doing what the whole point of it is to love God and others. All of the truth is summarized by that, to love God and others. So if you're not loving, you don't really know the word, do you? You just know about it and things that it says. But the idea of being surrendered to God's sovereignty and not having an excuse not to know God's will isn't even an excuse for infant Christians, for brand new Christians. And that's not a uh, pejorative term. Scripture has no problem with you being young in your faith at first. It has a problem with you being young in your faith when you should have already grown in the elementary truths, to quote the author of Hebrews in chapter 6. Um, and those truths, if you look at that chapter, are, are things that the church now sees as like 500 level doctrine, like the really hard stuff, but they're all 100 level. Um, we might go there a little bit later, but <clears throat> the point is, even if you're an infant in Christ, you have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and he can convict you about what sin, even before you know everything about the Bible. And so actually, oftentimes, I find people that have just come to faith and are just recently repented of their sin and overwhelmed with the joy of salvation, uh, very rarely against the God, grain of God's will. Uh, I think you I think about that. When people are brand new in their faith, it's, it, they're, they're usually growing really quickly and they're so excited and it's rare that you find them uh, just intentionally and blatantly against God's will because that salvation and the joy of it and that transformation is so fresh. Um, of course, that's not always the case. I'm just saying that it's, it's not so much about mastery of his, of his will as it is about surrender to it. But you do have to know some of it. You can't just go around neglecting to read God's word. And I want to talk about the summer. And I... I I find guilt trips about reading God's word more, not only ineffective, but damaging to the church. And so none of this is meant that way. Uh, we've built our whole church in a way, and we continue to try to build it that way, that makes it easier for us to be in God's word. I, I've said this before, but uh, I played football in college and went and played Boise State, and they have what's called Smurf Turf, blue, blue football field, I don't think any other team does. It's very weird, it's like mirages. Your mind is used to seeing green and comparisons and contrasts according to that, and their field is blue. It creates a whole field advantage. One of the reasons why we've decided to do a church-wide Bible reading program that we call Word Like Fire, you can pick that up at the connection table if you want to. Uh, that reminds me, we have welcome cards here if you uh, are brand new and we see lots of brand new people. Sign up, assign uh, uh, information you want to give us about those welcome cards, turn it into the connection table and we'll give you a coupon, something like Dutch Brothers or Subway. And it's just a way for us to connect with you. Um, but the, the, again, the idea, um, now I've lost my train of thought thinking about Subway. <laughs> I don't even like Subway that much, but food will quickly get, say again. Word like fire, that's right. So we're trying to make it easy for you to be with the grain of God's will, reading God's word together. And it's like home field advantage because if we're all reading it at the same time, um, even if you get behind, I would just say, don't, don't try to read all of it and catch up. Uh, just start again where people are at because over coffee, it's like, oh yeah, I'm in the same place as you are. I'm learning about David. And um, so... Uh, it's a great thing when a church is not just talking about uh, the Euro Cup, if you're into soccer, which I am. Um, we're talking about the things of God. And then, uh, so, so we're trying to make it easy for, for you to do that. And we're going to be transitioning away from Genesis in the summer to Proverbs. 
Uh, the reason for that is our discipleship communities. We'd like to take a break from those in the summer to give our leaders a break. And so we'll be, uh, we're, we've titled this sermon series, Way of Kings. It's an awesome one, lots of wisdom in the summer. But you need to be thinking about, especially as a father, but also anybody that has influence, which is everybody, um, are you really in God's word? Are you building out your knowledge and understanding of his word? You're responsible for it. And if you don't, uh, you don't want to be Isaac. If he was ignorant, um, Rebecca wasn't. Right? You don't want to be in that category of, of doing things that seem like God's will, uh, but aren't. It seemed, I'm sure, like Isaac, to Isaac, <coughs> that of course, of course the firstborn gets the blessing, but that was not God's plan. Um, God works in mysterious ways, but he tells us the ways, and most of how he operates in terms of what we're responsible for, I would say all of it. You can know what God wants for your kids' lives by reading scripture. For example, he wants you to memorize scripture with them. Do you know that? Deuteronomy 6 says that. He wants you to, it's, it's supposed to be saturated by God's word in our family lives. It should be when we're eating, when we're going out, when we're coming in. Anything we do, there ought to be some kind of involvement. It ought not to be, we go to a baseball game and we don't take God with as a church, you know? So consider that. Consider, are you the kind of father that's leading your family um, towards that kind of godliness, and consider a plan for the summer. Do you have a plan for your continued spiritual growth during the summer? I found it's really easy to go on vacation and relax and want to rejuvenate and leave God at home wherever you live. Really easy. And then the first three days you're on vacation, you thought, I haven't prayed or been in God's word even once. Take your Bible with you, but make a plan. Make a plan of how you're going to have God go with you on vacation, the rejuvenation you need. The real, the spiritual recharging you need, you can't have apart from God. And so I don't know if this is particularly convicting for you because maybe you're not in that category where you're sort of out of the know, not sort of against the grain by not really knowing what God's plan is. Um, but Isaac very much seems like he's in that category. And so um, if it's ignorance, you don't want to be ignorant of God's word. It's not a way to surrender to his will at all. So let's continue in the story because Rebecca is against the grain in a much more blatant way, it seems, than, than even Isaac in this case. Verse five, now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two good young goats so that I may prepare them from them delicious food for your father such as he loves and you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies okay so before we even go into Jacob's response here um, this is an obviously intentional manipulative deceitful plan right Today in our laws, although the foundation for them seems to be eroding, uh, people's willingness to uphold the law is eroding, and the laws altogether are changing for the worse to become less Judeo-Christian, and we're experiencing um, the curse that that is in our nation, even just economically, but also socially, in lots of different ways. Um, But if you think about what she's doing here, (coughs) it's premeditated. Our law will use that. You know, a crime of passion, even a murder, is, doesn't have the same kind of serious consequences that a crime of passion does. They both have very serious consequences, but even today, even in secular circles, we understand that, like, oh, you planned it, and it, you planned this, it didn't just happen, like you were angry. Uh, there's something more acceptable about someone flying off the handle, and you can kind of put your, oh, yeah, I could maybe see myself flying off the handle, but man, you planned this out. You were eavesdropping. And you're, you're, the perpetration of the crime is more serious. And that's where Rebecca is at. That's what she's doing. And um, I think it's fantastic if mothers are strong. What I think is strong is conviction, though. Um, I don't mean physical strength, although mothers can be very physically strong. You know, a lot more people are working out uh, with weights these days. Um, but I also don't mean just strength of will, because strength of will can be against God. And since he's the ultimate power, you're actually quite weak if your strength of will is against God. All right? The strongest man who ever lived, Samson, um, made a vow, a Nazarite vow, right? And the, um, if I remember correctly, the vow, you're not going to eat, you're not going to cut your hair, and you're not going to touch dead things. And he's this willful man, but it's a tragic hero story because he's not surrendered to God's will and he 
um, ultimately does all of those three things. He drinks, he you know, touches a uh, dead, dead lion, and he um, cuts his hair. And so, or has his hair cut. He gives up the secret that his hair cut makes him not powerful. <clears throat> and so then you look at God's sovereignty and it was for Samson who's prophesied that he would overcome the Philistines who had been violently oppressing the Israelites in the promised land. And God's sovereignty uh, doesn't, doesn't cease to be sovereign. It just ends up costing Samson his life, his eyesight and his life. And so it's not as though Samson, doing the exact opposite of God's will, uh, was strong. It was actually weak. It diminished him uh, dramatically. Now, that is the way God wrote the story. So to some degree, to think of what if he hadn't done those things, what if he kept his vows, um, is sort of an exercise in futility. But um, in a very real way, it wasn't necessary for Samson to choose. It's not necessary for us to have been given all this power through the Holy Spirit and still do all of these against the grain of God's sovereignty kind of things or think those kinds of things. Why are we given these cautionary tales about the tragic hero other than, hey, don't do that. Don't break your vows. Don't give up your, your uh, you know, pearls to pigs is an example like don't trust Delilah's. You know, be wise um, and be innocent, but be wise, Jesus says. So I think of that going back transitioning just backwards here away from Rebecca for a second, you think about Isaac and like, what should have he done? Uh, should have he not? Uh, and what should have Rebecca done in this case? Isaac was about to bless Esau and she knows that's not God's will. So what should have she done? Should have she just passively stood by? Well, she sh most certainly should have not done things that we know are not God's way. Lying is not God's way. Manipulating, cheating, stealing is not God's way. Teaching your children how to do those things is not God's way. That's already known. That's not, God's not a liar, he's not a cheater, he's not a stealer. Those things are wrong. Uh, the Bible even talks about how those who are, who are not yet indwelt by the Spirit, who have not come to faith, have a conscience and know that. There's no excuse for it. Romans 1, you can go there. And it's also partly Romans 2. But the idea here is, what, so what should have she done? Uh, well, what she shouldn't have done, before we go to what she should have done, is not manipulate in that way. Um, but you think about, well, what God's plan, would have it come true? Well, if you're doing your Bible read through, then not that long ago, you were, I think it's Numbers 23, and it's the uh, pseudo prophet. He's like a fake half prophet, it seems. It turns out to be against God, ultimately, which is why I say pseudo prophet. His name is Balaam. And he had been hired because uh, he'd been known to be able to curse people and have some degree of, of spiritual power in that way. And uh, <coughs> hired by the king of Moab, whose name was Balak. And Balak wanted him to curse Israel so he could get like an advantage on Israel. I, think, I, don't, I can't defeat these people. Kings at time knew that these people had God's favor. So maybe if I curse them, then we could defeat them. And try as he might, Balaam can't curse them. You can go to Numbers 23 and read this. God turns his curse into a blessing. Uh, so I think in principle, at least, that establishes the idea that if Isa, even if Isaac had tried to pass this blessing on to Esau, God could have redirected him. I don't know exactly how God would have done that, but you don't have to take God's sovereign plan into your own hands. You don't have to try to do his will your way. And this is what Rebecca is doing. Even when it seems like, oh, he needs help. He doesn't need your help in accomplishing his, his will. He graciously calls us to participate in that. The author, uh, well, Peter, in uh, uh, Second Peter, talks about how um, uh, we actually participate in the divine nature, uh, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, and that, yes, effort is part of that, but again, it's, it's with the grain of his will. It's towards love, not towards hatred. It's, it's a really actually... Deeply crooked thing to do, to take advantage of the elderly. You know, the way that you feel when you hear about some uh, kind elderly man or woman having their entire retirement stolen by some, uh, you know, internet phone scam ring, and, and the way that you feel like there's a movie about that, and the main antagonist is very hateable. Like you just, oh, get him. You know, you want him to get what he deserves because he's been defrauding all of these people, but especially defrauding the, um, the kinds of populations that might be weakest towards this. You know, I'm not saying Isaac's faculties were going out, but as you get older, uh, you're not thinking as clearly as you were. You might be more alarmed by someone calling you saying, hey, uh, 
your retirement's in jeopardy, whatever scam they're doing. By the way, just don't ever give information that someone could get your bank account. Just don't do that online. You never have to do that over the phone. No matter how scary the situation is, one way to solve it is to go to your bank in person. You know, go to your bank in person. Uh, and, and yeah, that might take a little bit longer, but you just put the phone down if someone's asking for money or trying to get into your, uh, it can happen to any one of us. It's the, the scams are just really intelligent. But <clears throat> the way that you might feel towards someone who defrauded your grandmother out of a bunch of money, I think is in part the seriousness of what Rebecca's, Rebecca's doing here to her husband. I'm not saying she didn't love him. I'm not saying she's so much worse than him. It's just, they're, they're all against God's grain. Eventually, we find ourselves against God's grain too, so we shouldn't judge them, but that's what's happening here to Rebecca. She has decided to take God's sovereign plan into her own hands. So she's not against the grain quite the way Isaac is. Isaac is like doing the opposite of what God told him, whether by ignorance or uh, you know, by apathy or just because he has his own agenda, because he loves Esau more. He wants that son to be blessed. Uh, none of those are an excuse, but here Rebecca knows. She doesn't have her own agenda in it. She loves Jacob more as well. She's just, I wonder if she convinced herself that she was doing God's plan. You know, young men will sometimes th- say this. Uh, I remember I told my brother, uh, we've sort of switched positions and now I've uh, really committed my life to God and, and, and he sort of walked away and I pray for him and I have conversations about him and I even remind him of that he's told me this once. I was uh, dating a woman and uh, living with her in a way that you sh- as Christians should only live with your wife and uh, act towards with your wife and I'm, obvi- I'm intentionally, you know, PGing this, this kind of, you know exactly what I mean though if you're an adult. And... <clears throat> um, I said, I'm planning on having this be my wife anyway. I'm planning on this being the only woman. So in spirit, I'm I'm not really committing adultery. And he, you know, I'm a good with words and arguing. He finally just said, Matisse, you know you're being disobedient. And I just got quiet. It was at the coast. I was sleeping on the floor. He's sleeping up here. And I didn't have anything to say because I knew he was right. I know that's not the way it works. You commit first and then you get all those benefits, right? It's, there's there's a cowardice in not committing and then getting all the benefits in a relationship. So um, it's so easy to deceive ourselves. I had started deceiving myself that I was with God's plan for marriage because I was in my mind and heart monogamous towards this person, but I knew God's will and I knew I was being disobedient. And so I think Rebecca very much did as well. So maybe you're in that category. Uh, Mothers should be strong. They should be strong. Uh, the Bible actually says to, uh, Paul in Corinthians uh, says to the entire church, men and women, be strong, act like men, right? Cowboy up. We know what it means. And I think in a very real way, spiritually, be strong, act like men means have strong convictions, know God's word. Uh, don't be so easily tossed to and fro as a mother. Uh, and yet it's not at all strong to just strong arm your child and, and manipulate them. And so there's the strength of women isn't good without God just like the strength of men is not good without God. So it's really serious. I mean, the damage that this causes, let's, let's keep, t- keep reading, but the damage that this causes um, throughout as the generations proceed is, is at the end of his life, uh, Jacob is talking to Pharaoh, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's probably 49 or so of Genesis, and he says to the Pharaoh, a few and evils have, a few and evil have the uh, years of my sojourning been, and they've not attained to the years of my ancestors or my forefathers. So few and evil. Do you want that to be the way that you have to feel about at the, at your life at the end of your life, few and evil? Oh, man. And just we're going to talk about some of the things that it starts here. It started before, even when he stole Esau's birthright, it starts these cascading effects that he ends up looking back and like few and evil, you know? So uh, here we go, continuing here. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock. I'm going to skip forward here um, because I've already read it. Um, And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. Um, this is obviously like, oh, I don't want to get caught. It's not the same thing as that's wrong. I shouldn't do that, mom. So I'm going to get caught. And being caught against the grain of God's word is a curse. 
Uh, really, the ultimate message here, I'll tell you in the middle and then at the end again, is that only Jesus can take that curse of you being against the grain of God's will upon himself. Uh, only Jesus can forgive that. You can't pick the splinters out for yourself. Um, so here, here Jacob is, and he's also not right with God. He's only concerned about that kind of curse, but look at what his mother says in verse 13. His mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. Um, in a very real way, uh, there was a terrible consequence that happened to Rebecca. Um, I didn't even realize until I started studying it very carefully. You know, Rebecca's death isn't even mentioned in the Bible. We know that she died because uh, I have, I think I have it up, um, Genesis uh, is it 49. Yeah, it should be on there. There they buried Abraham and Sarah and his wife, and there they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife, and there they ba buried Leah. I think there might be one more verse. In the field, we just talked about that a couple sermons ago, in the cave that is in, uh, in it where they bought it from the Hittites. So it's just her burial place is mentioned. But um, everyone else's uh, death is mentioned, like Rachel's death is mentioned, Isaac, Abraham's death is mentioned. You know, I think it's Genesis 35, if I have that up. Even her nurse death is mentioned. And Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died and she was buried under the oak below Bethel. So he called its name Alan Bakuth, um, which means oak of weeping. And so he's weak at weeping for, um, for Deborah, Rebecca's nurse. And, and, and some scholars think, well, that's an indication that Rebecca had already died too because he's so sad about her nurse dying. It's like the last thing he remembers of her, a person that was a special person that reminds him of her. We don't know though. We don't know when Rebecca died. Her death isn't even mentioned. And there's no evidence that she ever saw Jacob again. Her solution to Esau's murderous rage will be to send him away uh, to the same place where she came from, to her brother Laban. And it seems she never saw him again. You know, so, man, can you imagine how hard, it, hard that would have been? And, uh, you know, there's just so much damage that happens. Separation. Separation of close friends when you manipulate. Have you ever been manipulated by somebody? You feel like being friends with them still? I wonder if Isaac ever found out that she did this. Um, because maybe he just thought, oh, Jacob's the deceiver. But if he had, it would have most certainly caused distance in their relationship. So I think about that. Are you as a wife, according to, um, it's not a popular idea, but it's very clear in scripture that, um, especially Ephesians 5, if you want to look, uh, that husbands are to portray the role of Christ uh, in their headship in marriage and that wives are to portray the role of the church in willing to follow, not worship, but follow their husbands. And so marriage is really a picture of the gospel and Christ's relationship to the church. And again, our culture, and it's unfortunately seeped into the church, has subverted that and made it sound like, oh, it's just a partnership. In a lot of ways, marriage is a partnership. But ultimately, God has put the responsibility of spiritual leadership on the husband. And undermining him, you might think, well, I'm, I need to, I'm not going to be domineered by him. I'm, I'm going to get my own way. But uh, according to Malachi, we have been in marriage made one with a portion of God's spirit. And so you're harming the unit of marriage. You're harming yourself, right? There's, there's no, you can't undermine your husband. And I want to talk about a specific way that I've seen, um, that, and, and husbands do this too. And we're just talking about wives here because we're talking about Rebecca. Uh, there's, we just got done talking about how Isaac was not there spiritually. Like, it's not great to be married to a man who's sort of spiritually in neutral at all. Uh, and when he is, you might start getting frustrated with him. And then you're in, in uh, social situations and you're like rolling your eyes at what he says. And people see that. And you're scoffing and kind of like, like your husband's so dumb for saying these things. And partly maybe because you're a little bit embarrassed that maybe he's saying things that you're not proud of biblically. Or, or maybe it's not even that. But um, I don't think it's fake to be frustrated with what your husband says, but not publicly with your nonverbals undermine him. I've seen it happen before. Um, that's not fake. Uh, I think you withhold those and you still, t like no one said you can't go home and say, hey, I didn't like what you said there. It hurt my feelings, it bothered me, or I don't think that's biblically right. There's no reason why you can't talk to him. I'm just mentioning one way in which I think we, um, in the church, let ourselves off the hook. People see your nonverbals. And so what does that say about your husband? Well, he's not respect worthy. He's not, you don't respect him. So why should others? So think about those things. Are you, and this is one example, are you, because you don't think he's leading the right direction, trying to manipulate from below, 
you know? And men do it too. They'll try to manipulate who's ever in charge of them. Anybody that doesn't want to do whatever their boss or someone superior has, has said that they have to do will try to find a way of getting out of having to do it. It's human nature. So it's not just women that get manipulative. Men can be very manipulative as well. So it's to everyone. Children can be super manipulative for a very young age. Children, I can discern the difference between what I call a punishment scream, where Ezra, or I always say Ezra, but it's Noah now actually. Noah is like screaming to get his way. He does it with his siblings, you know? And so if you give in to that, you're kind of creating a little monster. He'll just scream more to get his way. What else is he supposed to do? He'd, oh, that works. I guess I get candy when I scream, you know? From the very earliest ages, we know. So um, <clears throat> you need to think about that. In this case, we're talking about wives or women because of Rebecca. Um, the world always likes to pretend like... Um, uh, you know, uh, especially these days, men are somehow more evil than women. Well, we all have it in us, and you might think about that. Are you in a category of trying to manipulate God's will for yourself? Are you deceiving yourself and thinking, I'm doing what's supposed to happen, but you're doing it with underhanded means. It's, it's not good, and again, it's the kind of thing that Jesus ultimately has to die for to redeem. So back to the story here, because I want to go through um, not just Rebecca, but also what Jacob did. And uh, so uh, she says, bring them to me at the end of verse 13. And verse 14, so he went and took them. He does it, right? And now, um, before we even continue, the Bible does say that God will hold certain people more accountable than others. Pastors and elders who are held to a higher standard. They have to be qualified according to biblical qualifications. For example, they need to be a husband of one wife. They need to not be given to drunkenness. There needs to be a measure of self-control, just to name a few. They need to rightly divide God's words. They can't just be saying the opposite of what it says. All of those are what are considered below reproach. So they should not be uh, an elder if those aren't qualities present and persistent. So yeah, they get held to a higher standard than other people. I think that's different than you putting a pastor on a pedestal. We're still just sinners in need of the cross. So am I. Um, so don't be shocked if you catch me on a day where I'm not really behaving. I'm, I'm my very best behavior on Sunday mornings. I'm glad that I'm not part of a reality TV show. I don't want everything I've ever said filmed for everyone to see. So, um, but we still are held to higher, higher standards. So person's in responsibility, and she's in responsibility of Jacob. To a degree, sh she would have been held more responsible by the God that we know. He's known his character. But that doesn't mean Jacob wouldn't have been held responsible because he knew what he was doing was wrong. You can feel it. You're convinced in your soul. God's made it that way, so we're without excuse. So let's continue. Uh, then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, verse 15, her older son, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son, and the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck, and she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared uh, into the hand of her son Jacob. So he went to his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. And at the very minimum by now, he's just blatantly lying, and it was also premeditated. So you don't get to say, well, so-and-so told me so. That's just a sin diversion tactic. And I think we ought to call each other out lovingly, but clearly when you see someone diverting from the sin. I'll give you one example of how people do that. You're just judging me. Now, if you really are, you're not going to be very effective in helping a, someone be redirected to be with God's grain. But... We know that we're afraid of people telling us, and especially God telling us that we're judging them. So if they say, you're just judging me, when all you're really doing is trying to correct something lovingly that you know is going to be splinterous spiritually in their lives, um, don't just be so easily deterred by that. Think in that moment, am I? Because I don't think I'm better than them, if, if, if you're right spiritually. And I don't think that if I had lived their life that I might not have fallen to this temptation. In fact, I have before. So no, no, I don't. This isn't about me thinking that I'm better than you. I am trying to show you from the outside, I think you have a blind spot here and you need redirection. It's loving to correct in that way. And um, one, another qualification of elders, I think, is to let no one disregard you. You can't just be the kind of dad that never disciplined his kids and they're running all over him and be like, expected to be able to lead a church and let people run all over you. There's a difference between being a passive aggressive, aggressive, it's assertiveness. There needs to be a degree of assertiveness in your life. And Jacob could have used a friend here that would have been assertively telling him, he's, this is wrong, what you're doing, before he went in. But at least at this point, he's blatantly lying to his dad, taking advantage of his dad in his old age and weakness. 
Uh, and he says, I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. Manipulation will always take something good and use it to twist. It's not wrong that Isaac likes delicious food. It's not wrong for anyone to like delicious food in that way. But to use somebody's interests and likes and manipulators know just how to do that. They know just how to get a hold of something that someone likes and use it for their advantage. Um, and, and so this is what, what Jacob has become good at. He's quite good, and he learned it from his mom to some degree. But Isaac said to his son, how is it, excuse me, uh, nine, verse 19, Jacob said to his father, I'm Esau, your firstborn, firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game, that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? Hunting takes time. Uh, just real quick aside, for fun's sake, um, although this isn't fun, I've spent hours and hours and hours uh, driving from clear cut to clear cut and walking to this play and that. And since I started hunting, I've not seen a single elk. <laughs> I thought, oh no, this, uh, I, I, um, someone in our church generously gave me a uh, 300 H&H Magnum, which is a, an older gun, but one that uh, they used to use for like a thousand yard uh, target competition. So it'll, it'll shoot the distance with some punch. And the ammo is very expensive. And before I went hunting, I was like, I don't know, can I pay for this expensive ammo? Well, one thing you learn as a hunter is you actually never take a shot until you do. And then it's only one. So you really, very little ammo. Right, um, So it takes time to hunt. It takes a lot of time. So why is he back so soon? What's going on? Um, wouldn't have understood this as deeply three years ago before I had ever hunted. I'm like, that bush, that's an elk. Like, no, it's not. Um, so how is it that you found it so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Then Isaac said to the Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him <coughs> because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. And so he blessed him. He said, are you really my son Esau? And he answered, I am. Then he said, bring it to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near him and he ate and brought him wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garments and blessed him and said, and before we get to the blessing here, I don't think there's any evidence here that the Bible is saying that it's um, that somehow this is part of the ignorance that I was talking about with Isaac. He just gets tricked, you know, and he sort of, he sort of I don't know if this has ever happened to you where you kind of see through it, but not clearly, and they go along with the trickery. It ha it's happened to me, and it doesn't take blindness or even maybe uh, not that great a hearing. He hears the voice, like, doesn't seem like Esau, but it's, it feels like him, so probably him. Um, it, being tricked by other people, the fault is on the trickery and the person tricking, not, not necessarily the person being tricked. And, but that causes great damage. We'll see it a little bit later how much it damages Isaac. But here's this blessing that actually belongs to Jacob, but he's getting it by ungodly means. See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed May God give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. The Lord over, uh, be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. Now, interestingly, if we can put the Hebrews passage up, I think this one is in Hebrews 11, so let's go with that one. Um, it talks about by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. Okay, so that might be a good argument to say that Isaac was not willfully, knowingly going against God's will. He's thinking he's blessing Esau. Either way, this is an example of a man going back to that first category of the kinds of ways that people can get against God's grain like Isaac did. Um, let's just say he didn't know, which may be the case. And, but it was by faith, he's still blessing Esau with the blessing of Abraham. It's not fully directionally incorrect. He's wanting to do God's plan. He's passing it on to the wrong person. It's like they say to, um, to uh, Marines when they have a good plan, but terrible, you know, a good initiative, poor judgment kind of thing. <laughs> Sometimes the judgment's unbelievably poor. Uh, I would tell you funny stories, but I'm going to save the time here. But um, 
Funny stories Marines have told me about the things that they did uh, with good intentions that turned out terrible. Uh, but anyway, the, the point here is uh, that he actually invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau by faith. Uh, and we'll find out that later he actually accepts the fact that Jacob was blessed by him and reaffirms that blessing at the beginning of chapter 28 of, uh, of Genesis, which we won't get to today. Um, so he, he, and you see this blessing uh, passes on um, <clears throat> to Jacob and then from, from Jacob continues to pass on and uh, without that passing on of the blessing, there wouldn't end up having been the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So this is God's plan through the patriarchs and going on and on to end up bringing uh, his own son out of all this brokenness to be the savior of the world. That's really what this story is about. I'll uh, show you that from a passage in Galatians towards the end of the sermon. Um, it doesn't change the fact that in his heart there was still something wrong. Not fully directionally incorrect like Esau, but off of center trying to bless um, Esau instead of Jacob. Um, and as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely done, uh, gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father Esau, his brother came in from hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I'm your son, your firstborn, Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. So just put yourself in Isaac's shoes having been so deeply deceived. And we don't know whether he ever really found out that Rebecca had conspired in this way. We know at least he figured out that it was Jacob. So this is how relationships between fathers and sons are broken long-term, really. Um, they don't have to be. We'll also see the author of Hebrews talking about failing the, to obtain grace to be forgiven and forgive others. Now, bitter roots uh, uh, comes up out of that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's, the damage is severe. He's trembling. So a physical response to this spiritual damage that's just happened. And that's not the way as a wife that you want your husband to find out God's will. It, you love him. They loved each other. That's not the way that it has to happen. And so it's just another example of the kind of damage that's happened. My guess is there are people here who have relationships with people that they love dearly, um, but maybe you kind of twisted the truth and they found out and now you're not friends or vice versa. And uh, so let's not act like being just a little bit against God's grain, even though you're not totally against it, is going to lead to anything but pain and heartache. Pain and heartache. As soon as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Your brother came deceitful and he's taken away your blessing. Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? Like, Cheater is not rightly named cheater, for he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he has taken away my blessing. Then he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? <clears throat> Just quickly, I want to define the difference between a birthright and a blessing in this case, biblically. Um, they are intertwined and overlap to some degree. But the birth, birthright is primarily about the inheritance. And so you can kind of think that in, in physical terms, like the money and the things that he's going to get as a result of that. Uh, whereas the blessing, this is a unique thing that God is doing in this particular family, passing this blessing on from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob. It's the Abrahamic covenant, this blessing for all nations that he's going to render through these families. That's what the blessing is really about. And it's interesting that Esau seeks that blessing without being right with God in the first place. So it might be easy to be like, oh, wow. And, and I think there'd be something calloused about not having any empathy for Esau here. This is a really painful moment for him. But it's not the kind of painful moment that leads him to repent, right? Those painful moments God brings into your life uh, where are, that like are meant to bring you to an end of yourself and you don't, you harden yourself again against him, which Esau did. We've talked about how that was according to God's choice and plan in Romans 9 a while ago. But I want to go to um, Hebrews, I think this is in chapter 12, and I think we have it up. Um, 
and I have it myself here as well. Yeah, so the author of Hebrews is talking about the idea of failing to obtain God's grace, but he uses Esau as an example here. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. And the author here is not talking about that he found no chance to repent. It's that he found no chance to repent, though he sought that blessing with tears. So he didn't repent. He was unrepentant. And um, so, so the idea that you would have the blessing of uh, being in a special relationship to God and him passing on his character and who he is to you and to your sons and that he's ultimately gonna bring your Messiah, his Messiah uh, through and, and their Messiah through that. But you're not even right with God in the first place and that's one more category to consider. You may be here and I don't know, so don't feel singled out. N nobody's here is thinking of you or unless they really know you, then they're probably lovingly thinking, I want this person to be saved. But consider, are you uh, against the grain of God in, in a like directionally incorrect way? It's not just that you're doing one thing wrong, but you're generally for God. You, you're not really willing to say, I need to be forgiven for my sin. If someone says, do you think you go to heaven? It's like, well, yeah, I've been generally a good person. You're not willing to recognize that uh, by God's definition, according to his word, which is truth, you're not a good person. You need to be forgiven. The sin comes out of your heart. The things that you speak are not just sort of actions that went out from you, but don't say anything about who you are. Uh, they say that you're sinful and you can't be forgiven apart from asking God to forgive you. And he's made a way through his sons. I think I actually want to go there early. This is um, uh, Galatians. So if we can put the Galatians passage up, I'm going to wait for you guys to put it up there. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hanged on a tree. I'm talking about the cross. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. That's us. Uh, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So this is about our salvation right now too. Not just about Jacob, Esau, Esau and, and Rebecca and Isaac, these ancient people. And think, what does this have to do with me? It actually is as important as your salvation. If today you're against the grain of God's will, uh, all you need to do is repent and then confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. It's that simple. It's nothing that you've done that brings that about. In fact, all the things that you've done apart from God before repenting in the first place, God calls, calls filthy rags. They didn't make me look good. Uh, you did them for yourself. No matter how good they might be, they're in the category of sin. And so that's a tough message. That's a tough message. You think, well, I don't think that's true. And, and then you keep walking like Esau did. And though you seek good things for yourself, you're against the creator of the universe and you're still hostile towards him. And you're in grave danger. Our, our world and the enemy will just try to continue to conform your mind uh, to the point where you will, although won't even recognize it anymore because there's a callousness that happened there, uh, start affirming things that are so much more evil than you ever thought you would. And uh, so... Now is the day. I'm gonna be praying a prayer at the end that you can follow if today would be the day that you decide I'm not gonna be like Esau. I'm not gonna be unrepentant and try to seek God's blessing without being right with him in the first place. And uh, there's, it's, it's just about the easiest thing you could ever do because you're just admitting I can't do anything and Jesus did it all for me. So the power's not yours. So I want you to consider that. But we're gonna continue reading here. Um, does someone remember which verse I was at? Uh, I just lost my spot thinking about Esau. Esau might not read uh, Jacob. Say it again. 34. Uh, as Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me even me also, O my father. That reminds me of what I want to say. In, by the time, if we can put the author of Hebrews back on, especially that, um, uh, that verse about the bitter, bitter root, um, the author of Hebrews is talking to Christians. So yes, when you really think about Esau, there's an application there for people who haven't yet put their faith in Christ in the first place, but there's also an application for Christians. Have you ever been not forgiven by a Christian? I have. And there have been times where it's taken me a long time to forgive another Christian. Just because we're Christians doesn't mean we are even necessarily morally better than some people on the outside. It's that we have admitted that we're not. 
and that Christ is. That's the only real difference oftentimes. You should find more differences in the church. Unfortunately, you don't always. And um, I haven't even found uh, that, yes, the only times I've ever experienced real forgiveness was in the church, but it happens less than you would think. As a pastor, it seems more often when there's a sin, people don't forgive each other. And when you don't, this root of bitterness, you can see it in people's eyes. It's like when the anger goes cold and they don't necessarily seem that angry of a person until you scratch the surface and that, that, ire get, that anger gets hot again and they're there and you're the one that did something just like the person they haven't forgiven and they hate you for it. And uh, you'll sometimes see this with... Um, men or women that have been through more than one diver divorce. And I saw, uh, I don't really watch late night talk shows anymore because there's just so much stuff in there. It's not good for Christians, but I'll never forget. I think it was Craig Ferguson that said, what I look for in a woman, because I'm mostly dating women that are like older than, like close to my age, 35 and 40, whatever age he was. I'm just looking for a woman that's not bitter. And whatever guests he had is like, well, good luck with that. You know, and I don't think they were talking about, oh, only women get bitter at 35. It's like the more experiences that you've had where you don't have the power to forgive one another, the more likely you're going to start having that kind of bitter root. And, and by the way, right along with that, when that bitter, why is it that it, come, it defiles many? Well, you've seen this happen. Does, does the person that's angry at you and hasn't forgiven you just keep it to themselves? They rarely do. They start gossiping. They start talking to everyone but you, or maybe you've done that. And that just spreads the anger. I've seen people... Close friends be separated by these kinds of bitter gossip rumors who no, neither of them did anything wrong towards each other except to listen to the gossip about what's happened. Uh, and uh, I don't know, I mean, I have lost close friends and it's very painful. Uh, there are actually a few things I think that are quite m more painful spiritually than losing friendships, especially when they could just be healed. So as a Christian, a failing to t obtain the grace of God is not about like losing your salvation or gaining in the first place, you already have it, but it's about uh, obtaining the grace to actually forgive somebody. To actually, you're gonna walk in, you don't think that that root of bitterness won't grow. Let me tell you a quick story and we'll be close to concluding here. Um, uh, the, so in college football, you know, at, at least in the past, I don't know about now with all the the, uh, name and recognition money that people can get. But you weren't allowed to give college football players money. Uh, and so the wealthy supporters, in this case I was playing at Portland State, found ways around that. And how would they do that? Well, I have this whole English ivy patch that I would like to get ripped out of the garden. And um, how about I pay your guys hourly and pay them really well? So they keep paying like $58 an hour. It's like you know that's an added benefit to, to football players. But they're, they're hiding it with wages. And, you know, I don't think it's illegal, but I... I at the time, I gladly took it. And uh, English ivy can get unbelievably gnarly. Like, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they're like almost like tree branch kind of vine roots that are coming off of it. And they'll pull whole trees down if you don't take it off soon enough. And so at the time, and I, I don't mean to brag. In fact, let me just tell you, I took steroids. So don't be impressed by these numbers. But I was uh, repping, deadlifts when you pull a, a barbell off the ground, repping with over 500 pounds. Uh, like for 10 reps, right? Unbelievably strong. And so were all the other guys around me. I was selling steroids to them, you know? This is part of my story of how I was more like Esau than any other character. It's totally against the grain of God's will. Uh, probably more like Jacob because he did actually save me. Um, and so uh, we're trying to rip out these root balls. You find the root balls of the, um, of the English ivy and it's me and at the time, defensive and offensive linemen don't really get along unless they're being paid $50 an hour together. And uh, we would call them lazy slobs and they would call us violent idiots, except that those were not the words we actually used. <laughs> just, just the meaning. And here we are trying to like deadlift, rip this stuff out of the ground. And um, the one, you know, it, there is some truth to, that you oftentimes find offensive linemen are maybe a little bit more intelligent than defensive linemen. And I was the defensive lineman, didn't come up with the idea. It was some other guy. And he said, why don't we just drench this all in water and come back tomorrow? We could not pull this root out. There are at least four of us holding on to it, pulling it out. Imagine the force of that many strong men and it would not come out of the ground. Uh, that bitter root does not go away apart from the grace of God. Uh, you know, we talk about a deadlift. It's, it's the cross of Jesus Christ that deadlifts that root of bitterness back out, even for Christians. You have to come to the foot of the cross. The longer it's been growing, the more embedded in your heart it gets and the harder it is to admit and come out. And you have this sadness in your eyes, you're going to see someone where bitterness has taken control like that. Don't let that happen. It destroys whole churches. It destroys whole, you know, micro social relationships. It just has so much damage. And, and this is exactly what ends up happening to Esau. Let's continue and then finish. 
Have you not reserved a blessing for me? He says in 30, 36 at the end. 37, Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him lord over you, and all his brothers I have given to him for servants. And with grain and wine I have sustained him. Uh, what then can I do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And then Isaac had his father answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be. And away from the dew of heaven on high, by your sword you shall live and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. And then I will kill my brother Jacob. That's the bitter root. That's how serious it is. But the words of Esau, her, um, her older son, were told to Rebekah. So she sent and called Jacob, her younger son, and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau comforts himself about you by planning to kill you. Really dark, right? And you think, oh, I'm not like that. I'm... When's the last time you've kind of enjoyed a revenge fantasy? I will sometimes find myself, and that's oftentimes how I'll find out, uh-oh, I have failed to obtain the grace to forgive that person because I'll have a loop going on in my mind about how I'd like to get back at them. And until that loop breaks and you don't have that in your mind anymore, you can't be certain that you've forgiven them. So even if it comes in layers, just keep saying, no, 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 no. We don't take revenge. I don't want that playing in my mind. I mean, the very person that you dislike so much is the one that's owning your mind at that point, right? And they don't even know. So uh, comfort our, comforting ourselves by thinking of planning harm for others the best of us do it at times. It just depends on how hurt you've been. And he was deeply hurt. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother, in Haran. And say with, stay with him a while until your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of both of you in one day? I thought that was an interesting sentence because even though she favors Jacob, uh, even in this moment, it doesn't seem like she uh, uh, doesn't also care about Esau to a degree. She doesn't want to lose both of them in one day. So um, the fallout of lying and cheating and stealing, it's, it's never uh, a way that helps God with his plan. Um, God's plan is unthwartable. It's like we're, we're swimming in his sovereign will. And so even, like, why swim against the current? Why be against the grain? Why not just swim with it? Well, because the current is scary. The current requires us to let go of control. I want to read this last verse, which is more of a foreshadowing of the others, and then conclude with the cross here. Verse 46, then Rebecca said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries one of the Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? He's talking about Esau's wives um, that don't share their, uh, their faith and, and their worldview and they become, um, like I said, we'll talk about it more the next time, they become a real um, pain for her. She, like, I don't think she's exaggerating that saying it's just that terrible when, when you end up having to, to deal with people within your family that are just against everything you believe. You see that these days. You, know? um, you see that in the royal family. You know, I'm not even making any discernment or judgment calls, but th that's been ripped apart, I think, by different, different worldviews. Very painful, very difficult, and all avoidable. Can we put the main point back up? The way that you actually apply this main point of being surrendered to God's sovereignty means knowing and doing His will, His way, is by surrendering to the cross. That's what all this was about the whole time. It was just about Jesus. It was just about the cross. He's the only one that can take that curse. Rebecca can't take the curse on herself. None of you can take the curse of your own sin upon yourself, but Jesus did that. And so whether it is you need to stop failing to obtain God's grace and have this root ball of bitterness you can never tear out and it's harming all your relationships and every time you're triggered, you're blowing up at people. Uh, whether it's just, you know, I'm kind of undermining my husband or, uh, you know, whether it's even premeditatively manipulating people, whatever it is, the cross is the solution to that. It's, it's woven into the story that the cross is the solution to that. It's only Jesus that can help you no matter what the Spirit has been speaking to you today through any one of these characters' lives and their misadventures. 
And so I want to, like I said, um, I'm going to pray uh, a prayer that applies primarily to those who are maybe seeking to um, be directionally correct with God for the first time, be saved. Uh, but I think it's a prayer we can all pray. And then as Emily leads us in worship, we can come to communion. And, and again, uh, all you have to do is, I, I'm sorry that I've been so bitter. I should have forgiven a long time ago. And God will forgive you. He will forgive you. And the consequences will begin to dissipate because the bitter root is. And that's the same application for all the different areas you might be challenged in. Let me pray. Lord, I don't know if it is the day of salvation for someone in this room. I sure hope so, if that's where they're at in their life. And I pray that you would unharden their hearts, that you would cause them to no longer stiff arm you, and that in this prayer, that they would just know that uh, they're being brought along by your spirit, uh, you know, sought by the hound of heaven, so to speak, uh, to pray this prayer to be saved and to have the life changed and uh, be promised eternity. And so uh, this is uh, not some kind of formulaic prayer, but it's just the main content that anyone needs to say. And it begins with, Lord, I repent of all my sin. I ask for you to forgive me. I know that Jesus died for my sin. I know that you raised him from the dead. I put my faith in him as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands or anything like that, although uh, not just me, but the elders and other leaders are very much interested in knowing whether the, today was the day of your salvation. And so if, if that has been true for you, then I, I just pray that you, would, that you would let us know because the continued growth of, uh, is something that we want to help with, recognize and continue to found. And Lord, I pray that that would happen. Pray that we would be able to um, help really young Christians, no matter how old they are, uh, to found their faith and to continue growing and to resource them in ways that, that develops their faith towards something that deeply glorifies you. Thank you for this sermon. Thank you for your cross. Thank you that there is nothing, if, if anyone has done anything like Isaac, like Rebecca, like Jacob, or even like Esau, there's nothing that your cross can't fix. I pray that we would receive that by faith through communion today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.